Okay, we're, we're going to get started. Okay. At this time, y'all, come on. this time I'm going to ask Mr. Peake if he'll open us with prayer. Hey, we know that everything we have comes from you, and so we are grateful. Give us wisdom that we need today to make decisions that would honor you, and um, we give all the glory for all the things we have to you. Pray in your name. Amen. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, <laughs> hold, Chuck, hold on a sec. Pull that thing closer to you. I don't think anybody can hear you. I on? think I think the green light was off, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Am I better now? Yep. If, if we'll go back then, we're on the front page of the green sheet under uh, the Blue open sheet. rule, uh, House Resolution 1237 LC 930296. If everybody's there, I'll continue. This is an urging resolution, urging uh, Congress to uh, cease collection of the motor fuels tax in Georgia and, and by proxy across the country. Basically, there's an 18.5 uh, cent tax collected. Much of that money goes, uh, well, all of that money goes to Washington. Uh, much of that money comes back to the states. Uh, Georgia is a donor state, as are another number of others. And uh, what we're seeking to do here is to urge Congress to follow up on legislation that has been introduced in the House by, among others, uh, our former uh, member, Tom Graves, and in the Senate, uh, our Senator uh, Johnny Isaacson is sponsoring legislation, and we're just urging Congress to uh, pass that uh, measure and allow the states to keep their uh, money in the state. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Mr. Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm back on House Bill 879, which is on the first page of the blue sheet under modified open rule. Uh, again, this is a bill to provide for some just very basic rudimentary training and instruction in uh, diabetes management for schools that have type 1 diabetic, or, well, I guess type 2, but that really doesn't manifest itself in young school children, type 1 diabetic children. Uh, it's a critical bill to make sure these kids can go to uh, school in a healthy and safe environment. Uh, numerous other states have done it, including all the states around us, and I think it's an important uh, uh, piece of legislation for these kids so they can attend class in, a, uh, again, a healthy and safe environment, Mr. Chairman. Have you any questions? Yeah, we got questions. So, Mr. Public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Ramsey, just to reiterate, my understanding is that Sorry. My understanding is that from a cost standpoint, there really is no cost because the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation has a, a, an established program whereby they go into the school systems to go ahead and administer this training as to what is arguably the most prevalent what? childhood disease that, that, that those folks, that schools and any, any entity that deals with children has to deal with uh, generally these days. And so from a a cost standpoint, we're talking either de minimis or nothing other than the X number of hours, I assume one or two hours training that will that will in, be involved right. in um, in having the training. That's about it. I'm glad you asked that. There, 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 other than that, I guess to the extent that you can put a value on the 
couple of hours it takes to receive the training. I, I've, I've been through that training. Many family members have been through that training. Um, th th that's right. The, the diabetes, the American Diabetes Association has a has the, all the training resources that they will provide, and they've said this multiple times, free of charge to the state as they develop this pr this training protocol. Um, the training protocol is very prevalent and well known out there. There's, uh, it, it's it's something that can be again provided free of charge because there's so many resources out there, and we can make sure they get down to the school level, particularly in schools that don't have school nurses. This that's where it's really really critical because you know what this bill is not going to do is change the number of diabetic children in the state. They're sitting in class all day, every day, in what is potentially a life or death situation if they get outside their range on their blood sugars. This is a very unique disease in that it requires hour by hour management. You have to take account every meal that you eat, how much insulin you have to inject. Every time you go to PE, if I'm going to exercise a lot, am I going to have a low blood sugar situation? Do I need my glucagon shot nearby in case I get low and go into diabetic shock? So um, I appreciate the question, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here again today for House Bill 268, which is the posting of zoning signs on property and also uh, additional adding notification in regards to the joining property owners by mail. Do we have questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Buckway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I come back uh, again on House Bill 899. I realized yesterday after we were done, I spoke with Chairman Roberts, and uh, there may be uh, a question that I probably should have addressed yesterday relating to uh, Section 1. Uh, there's been some questions and some of our judges, and maybe some of you have heard from your judges that asking why we're moving the date of nonpartisan general elections, there seems to be a confusion that that's moving that back to November, which, as you recall, just last year we moved it to July. And I just want to bring to your attention, we're, we're not moving it to November. Uh, if you look at uh, line 36 and 37, it says they shall be elected in nonpartisan general election. A nonpartisan general election, we redefined when that is last year, so all nonpartisan elections were moved to July. This was a section of code that got missed and when they changed the law last year and so this just fixes that so if any of your judges were confused this does not change it back to back to November so if there are any other questions Mr. Chairman I'll be happy to answer those questions thank you thank you Mr. Maxwell Good morning Mr. Chairman members of the committee I'm back on House Bill 820 the guaranteed asset protection waiver and the retailer's requirement to uh, uh, issue these waivers. This is the bill we talked about yesterday, and I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to get with uh, Representative Setzer on the question he asked about the competition, if there would be an unfair comp uh, House Bill 820. Uh, the bill does two things. It provides the exemption for uh, in the insurance code for used car dealerships that prove they have $100 million in assets uh, and are sufficiently capitalized to sell limited repair warranties on vehicles they sell and also to sell debt cancellation waivers to the customers that finance vehicles with them. The question came up yesterday about is this going to create an un unfair competitive advantage for other dealerships? And I, I don't really know how it would necessarily. There's, you know, competition comes in all the time. Uh, we face competition with, uh, you know, um, insurance agents coming down the street, uh, lawyers, everybody else moving into town, and uh, we have, uh, you know, I think competition is probably pretty good if a dealership is currently uh, selling used cars and want to try to offer something like this. Uh, that would be, you know, if, if they want to. I'm not sure many of them do this on their own. So I'm not sure how the unfair competitive advantage might play into that, the question was asked. But uh, that's what the bill does. We've got a company out of Benton, Arkansas that's doing this in nine states. They're a large, uh, large carrier. They'd like to come into Georgia, and this is the uh, one of the ways they can come in because Actually, you really can't find insurance on the market out here to cover some of these. There's just nobody selling insurance, but uh, they do it all in-house. Uh, they work with the uh, locals for the repairs. Uh, I think it's a, uh, a good jobs creation for the state of Georgia, actually. It's going to help bring in some jobs. If there's any other questions, I'll try to answer them, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Golick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just as a, and this is a question that came up in committee, I thought it was a relevant point that as a practical matter, this is a market, uh, or this is a service that its market is usually in the rural markets, correct? Yes, sir. They're in and, rural areas. And it's a service that is not, and I can't say this with 100 percent certainty, but as a general matter, it's a service that's generally not offered in those markets to begin with. And so yes, you sir. have a new carrier coming in, providing a new service, potentially, probably, well, definitely creating new jobs in, in, a, in a rural target market area that isn't otherwise getting a service right now. That's correct. They go into the rural areas. They don't try to compete in the large metropolitan areas. Okay. They want to go to rural, rural areas, rural uh, small towns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Setzler. Hey, Mr. Chairman, that, that was really the nature, Representative Maxwell, my, Chairman Maxwell, my, my question was that um, um, what we're, these are products that are not being offered today, um, but we're allowing a company to offer a, a product um, based on their, um, based on the size of equity they've got in their company, $100 million or larger. But, they're, but a smaller company that might be $50 million in size would be specifically prohibited by law from doing this. Um, if, if there were financial instruments that allowed small companies or a small carrier to do this, they'd be um, perhaps prohibited by, as I read this, they'd be prohibited by law because the legislature's acted and said unless you've got this much equity, that this size of the company, you're prohibited from, from offering this kind of product in the state. Well, we have a, the insurance commissioner's office is going to monitor this. Uh, they could put up a bond if they wanted to come in here and, and offer something like that. They've got an option of the $250,000 bond in uh, the repair cost guarantee. Well, actually, this the, 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 way, the way it reads, it says a $250,000 bond and size of over $100 million. It's, it's what the insurance commissioner would deem. If, if, if they drop below the $100 million, if, if any of their uh, financial statements came in and they dropped below $100 million, the insurance commissioner's office, the way I understand it, could ask for $250,000 bond. They're not going to do both. It may it, have to post. Is there any law in the state that's, that specifically prohibits a company of any size that can marshal the financial resources and the financial instruments to do this from selling this kind of product? No. So today they could come in, they could find investors, they could find backers, underwriters that can underwrite this kind of um, product, offer the product today under current Georgia law. There, there's nothing prohibiting them from doing that. I'm concerned what this does is it provides a carve out that only they, if they're of a, a certain size, can offer this. Um, and it would specifically prohibit anyone of smaller size who could marshal the resources from offering this product. Well, if they can marshal the resources, then they could go to the uh, insurance commissioner's office and show that they've got the net worth and be able to do that. Under this bill. But if, yeah. if someone, again, under the 820 structure, if someone didn't have those financial resources of $100 million or larger, but could still find the backers to, to be able to support this kind of thing, um, they'd be specifically by law prohibited from doing that. Okay. I, I have no problem with, with open, leaving it as things are today where find a financial backer that can support this, offer the product, that's great. But, but I, I, I'm just concerned and, I, and it, I wanted to confirm my understanding that we would be prohibiting somebody by law of smaller size from offering that product just because they didn't have the net worth in their company. Okay, I'm sure what you say. I'll get you an answer. Any other questions? Any other bills, Mr. Maxwell? No, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> you do have another one you won't eat. One eighty three. One eighty one. One eighty three. One eighty three. Yes, sir, I do have another one. I wasn't gonna ask for it today. I was gonna try to work one at a time, but one eighty three <laughs> is a uh, house retirement bill. Uh, for the, for the legislative retirement bill. Basically what this does, and you guys mostly, I hope all of you in here are under the LRS program. Down through the years, uh, as we've been in the, uh, the legislature and I've been in, in the retirement committee, I have uh, quite often people come back to me and say, uh, Mr. Chairman, I need a little help. I didn't sign up for LRS when I got here for whatever reason, and I realize now I want to be in LRS. What can you do for me? Well, I tell you I'm sorry, 
and you have to go on your way. Uh, what we're trying to do in this bill here is allow a person that is reelected. It, it came to me a few weeks ago or, or several weeks ago that we are rehired every two years, basically. We are rehired in our positions every two years. We're up for rehire this year. Some of us will apply. We'll get rehired. Some people will decide not to apply again. And some people will uh, apply and not be rehired. But basically, we are coming in every two years. So what I'm proposing for LRS is for us to, every two years when you're rehired, if you are not a member of LRS, you have the opportunity to join. Uh, you've got the same opportunity coming in November, and you can join LRS. We're not changing the vesting requirements. You still have to be in LRS eight years to get vested. If you mess around two terms and you don't want to be in LRS, you come back and say, oh, I think I want to join this year. You've still got to go eight years from that point to get vested in LRS. If you are a current member, you don't have to do anything. When you come back in, your time just rolls right on. Nothing has to happen. Uh, there are several people in, LR, or in the legislature now that have never joined. So this bill does two things. We're giving them a window of opportunity starting July the 1st this year through December the end, end of December to allow you the opportunity to join LRS, pay all the uh, actuarial cost, nothing to the state there. You're going to have to pay the full amount. And then you can pick up the time and go forward. So that's basically what this bill does, these two options. Every two years, when you're rehired, if you have not become a member of LRS, you can join. If you have not purchased or not, not in there now, you're going to have a window of opportunity. And that's what 183 does, Mr. Chair. I'll try to answer questions on that. The only question that the chair would have would be you need to do this on the health insurance side also. Uh, people can't get in. You don't choose it. You ain't going to get it. Give them another opportunity as they're rehired every two years. It's, it's there. If, you, if, you get the, uh, if you're in LRS, it's the same uh, availability that you have now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Uh, Thank you, Member. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, Mr. Smith. Um, say you've been in the legislature four years, can you buy back that time? You mean in Under going forward? Right. No, sir. You cannot buy it back. Okay. No, sir. We're, only, we're giving you a one-time opportunity this year that if you've not been in, you, you've got a time from July the 1st through the end of this year to buy back what time that you might have forfeited by not, not being a member. But, but can, going forward, you can't. Okay, but you can buy it back right now. If with this bill passes, you can buy it back in the summer. Okay. Yes, sir. That's what I was wondering. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm here to ask for, let me get the number correct today, uh, House Bill 845. Uh, it is a bill that requires child care uh, centers to educate the parents about influenza vaccination. The reason is, is that influenza vaccination uh, is a herd phenomenon. The more people that have it, the better off all of Georgians are. It is not a uh, requirement to get the influenza vaccination. It is educational only. The child care center has to log on to cdc.gov, print out two pages of information, and give it to the parents. That is all that's required. If they do not do this, they are not held civil or criminally uh, liable. Uh, it is an educational, informational bill only. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. On the back paid mod modified structure, first one, House Bill 372. All this bill does, this, was, this bill was brought for the Clerks Association. All this bill does is re reduce the amount of time that a Superior Court clerk has to hold on to an unclaimed cash bond. Currently under state law, they have to hold on to that bond for seven years. This would reduce it to a year. The best address a Superior Court clerk is ever going to have for someone who posted a bond will be in the first six months. After that, some of these people move out of the district. They don't let people know. So this just has been an accounting nightmare for our clerks, and they ask for that time to be reduced. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dempsey. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Um, I would like to ask again uh, for House Bill 434 to allow social workers to. Excuse me. And, and try, also, try it again. Am I on now? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask for House Bill 434, which will, uh, in essence, bring into alignment the scope of practice of licensed clinical social workers and allow them to receive reimbursement for diagnosing mental health, particularly. It will address some of the great concerns that we're seeing in this arena. Uh, also, I'd like to ask that it could be moved to modified structured to make sure that the conversation is only about licensed clinical social workers. Okay, any questions for Ms. Dempsey? Thank you. Ms. Sims? Oh, ooh, ooh. Mr. Mitchell, excuse me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I direct your attention to uh, modified structure, House Bill 419. Mr. Chair, uh, it's an extraordinary bill. It will give uh, <laughs> Georgians much needed consumer protection. Uh, and as it comes to foreclosure in this state, giving them a right to cure their foreclosure. I might add that this bill has been well vetted in the subcommittee of judiciary as well as the full committee has not received a negative vote anywhere in the process. Every consumer group, uh, every consumer group of uh, business, banking on uh, both sides of this issue, uh, have embraced this bill. Absolutely. And it's certainly good for the chairman's career. I would ask that uh, you would uh, schedule this bill, Mr. Chair. Any questions, Mr. Mitchell? Mr. Cassis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to request uh, House Bill 792 under the modified open rule. This is uh, a bill that came out of higher ed, and uh, all we're doing is amending uh, the non-public post-secondary educational act, uh, just relieving some institutions, uh, institutions that are accredited by recognized accrediting agencies, will be able to be licensed in Georgia without having every year to submit their catalogs and a whole list of, of materials. And so it's a paperwork reduction act. Any questions? Thank you. Now, Ms. Sims. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask for consideration on House Bill 776. It is, <laughs> it is um, an explanation of last year's bill that was not um, completely uh, clear. It is just verification for consolidated governments and nonpartisan elections. Thank you. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to put my name with uh, Representative Brockway on that House Bill 899. That is a uh, very much existing problem with what we did last year and not making the change as required also in the section is covered under that section one of his bill because the courts, <clears throat> all the superior court judges are up for election, public courts are really uh, in a quandary about which election should they be qualifying for and there may, may be challenges if we don't get it corrected. So it's an important bill we do try to get done. Thank you. Mr. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman Knight has already come before us with House Bill 875, the mining of data in your personal records, Department of Natural Resources. I'd like to uh, put my name beside that one. Also, um, uh, Representative Purcell's uh, putting dates on uh, zoning uh, requirements uh, and notices on House Bill 268. The Minority Leader, Ms. Abrams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask for HB 681. Uh, this is a food sales and service bill introduced by Representative Dickerson that would solve the um, nonprofit tasting uh, issue. I would also like to put my name beside the heavily lauded bill HB 419 by Mr. Mitchell. Heav he heavily lauded. Mr. Weldon, are you going to load? Just briefly, Mr. Chairman. 
I'd like to request that uh, HB 250 um, be put on the calendar, please. Um, this is a uh, retirement bill um, after the uh, uh, solicitor's retirement, trial judge retirement, and the superior court judge retirement fund were uh, merged in 1998. Uh, we have a few things we need to take care of. And Section 1 just ensures that the amount of benefits paid out to the members and any beneficiaries are not less than the total amount of the members' contributions. Um, section 2, um, this allows the uh, member to elect spousal coverage so long as the member pays the full actuarial cost. And uh, Section 3, that just provides for the election of uh, spousal, spousal benefits um, after the uh, uh, member of the system has uh, retired. I hope there's no questions, Ms. Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to put my name by House Bill 879. Uh, the Vice Chair was right. Juvenile diabetes is on the rise in schools. Probably every school has at least one child that's a diabetic. Um, children are active, and if their blood sugar drops, it can cause brain damage or even death, and somebody needs to know what to do in those situations. Uh, and I would also like to put it by House Bill 845 about the educating the parents about influenza. Cost to us on lost work of parents because of children uh, getting the flu and it spreading through schools. All right, that's all. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Who have we got? Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to put my name by uh, HB 875, uh, dealing with the uh, privacy of certain uh, records with the natural resources. Okay. Anyone else? All right, we're going to set the calendar for tomorrow under modified structure HB 875. Do I hear motion? Any opposed? Under modified structure HB 865. Do you hear a motion? Any opposition? Under modified open, HB 183, any opposition? Under modified open, HB 863, do, do I hear a second? Any opposed? Let's try it again. All right, all those in favor signify by aye. Those opposed? No. Uh, Ayes have it. Under modified open, HB 879. Move. Any opposed? Motion carries. And then back to put this one under modified structure. HB 434, it's under the open. R right now, we'll move it to modified structure. Have we moved? I hear a second. Any opposed? HB 434. That's the calendar.